Good evening. A few days ago, 9,000 migrants left Honduras in a caravan that's headed to the United States. However, it looks like they are meeting with resistance in Guatemala and in Mexico. Meanwhile, in recognition of the Trump administration's peace efforts, the King of Morocco has given President Trump the highest award that the monarchy can offer. Now, over in Washington, D.C., streets are being closed, and there are miles of fencing, barbed wire, and barricades, as well as armed guards posted at almost every single street corner. Basically, it's looking like a militarized zone ahead of the inauguration. And lastly, over at Twitter, a second undercover video has just been released earlier today showing that their censorship plan is not limited to America and is actually global. Let's go through these stories together. This is your never-ending 2020 election update, and I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Now let's start today's discussion by talking about Morocco. Three days ago, the King of Morocco, he bestowed upon President Trump the highest award that he possibly can, the Order of Mohammed. Now, the Order of Mohammed is basically the highest award that the King of Morocco can give to somebody, and it's only given to the heads of state. And the reason that he gave it to President Trump was to recognize his work in advancing a normalization deal between Israel and Morocco. Now, if you've been following the developments in terms of normalizing relations in the Middle East over the last few, um, let's say, months, Morocco was not an isolated case. Over the past five months, the U.S. has also helped to broker deals between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, as well as Sudan. These agreements were all aimed at normalizing the relations between these countries, as well as to establish some economic ties. And people were calling these deals great steps towards a more prolonged peace in the Middle East region. Now, Jared Kushner, who is a senior White House advisor and who helped push a lot of these deals forward, he has been working on reaching more agreements between Israel and different countries in the Arab world. However, no more deals are expected to come through before Trump's uh, first term in office is over this upcoming Wednesday. And in fact, let's talk a little bit about Wednesday. This inauguration of Joe Biden is set to potentially be the oddest one in living memory. Right now, Washington, D.C. looks more like a militarized zone rather than our nation's capital. There are fences with coiled barbed wire, security checkpoints, barricades, a giant wall around the South Lawn, and as many as 25,000 heavily armed National Guard troops stationed around the city. Videos that we saw that were shot by reporters or by people who are living in the city, they show streets being closed, workers putting up miles of barricades, shops and offices being boarded up, and of course, an increased military presence. Things like military vehicles can be seen parked on downtown streets, and armed guards are checking identification for people leaving and entering the city. So that indeed looks very militarized. In fact, the number of military troops in Washington, D.C. is 10 times the number of troops that America currently has in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. So how much is all this going to cost? Well, officials are estimating that this inauguration will wind up costing about $45 million. In terms of the amount of people who will actually be attending the inauguration, likely it'll be pretty small. Besides the heavy military presence, which might in and of itself keep people away, the mayor of D.C. issued a public statement urging people to stay home and to watch the inauguration virtually. Also, Airbnb is canceling all of their Washington, D.C. reservations during the inauguration weekend. And so there won't even really be that many places to stay. And right now I heard reports that most of the hotels in Washington, D.C. are booked by the soldiers. So. Now, some are criticizing this extreme level of security, saying that our nation's capital is like a pendulum. It swung from having uh, the bare minimum amount of security on January the 6th to now being a militarized zone today. For instance, Senator Rand Paul, he said, you know, government, they either underreact or overreact. So I think there was too little security, obviously, last week, and now we're going to become a militarized zone. Now, in terms of civil liberties, he went on to say that, and they're checking congressmen as they come in to see if they have a sharp pencil or a sharp pen. So it's gotten ridiculous. And so we'll see what happens and whether it's permanent. But most people who write about civil liberties say that in times of war or in times of stress or in times of crisis, you lose your civil liberties very quickly. If you'd like to read more about this militarization of Washington, D.C., or about the award that the Moroccan king gave to President Trump, those links will be in the description box below this video for you to check out. Also, while you're down there looking for those links, please notice that the like button that's below this video is not guarded by any troops. There is no barricade stopping your finger from hitting that button. So there is no risk to your personal safety to take a quick moment to smash that like button, which will force the YouTube algorithm to share this video out to potentially thousands of more people, letting the truth be known far and wide. Now let's talk about the caravan. 
In an earlier episode late last week, we discussed the fact that there is a new caravan that was forming in Honduras, planning to make its way up here to the United States. Now, since then, that caravan has actually grown considerably, and it now consists of approximately 9,000 people. Think about that, 9,000 people that are marching their way up here to the United States. Now, when these Honduran migrants crossed into Guatemala, they were able to push past the police officers and past the soldiers that were posted at the border. In fact, take a look at this video that was shot three days ago. It was taken at the Honduran-Guatemalan border. And by the way, in regards to that video, for your reference, I want to mention two things. First of all, there were about 2,000 police officers and soldiers that were stationed at the border when that took place. But as you saw, they obviously were not able to block the caravan. And secondly, most of the migrants entered Guatemala without showing a negative coronavirus test, which is currently against the law there. Now, unlike previous years, the governments throughout the region, throughout the Central American region, have made it clear that they will not be letting this caravan through. The day after that video was shot, Guatemalan soldiers, they formed in ranks across a highway, blocking the procession of migrants, and they began to send them back in buses back to Honduras. In fact, the president of Guatemala, he issued a statement calling on the Honduras government to contain the mass exit of its inhabitants and that the government of Guatemala regrets this violation of national sovereignty and calls on the governments of Central America to take measures to avoid putting their inhabitants at risk amid the health emergency due to the pandemic. Now, Mexico, which would be the next country that the migrants would hit if they were to successfully cross Guatemala, is also getting ready. Thousands of Mexican National Guard troops are currently being drilled at the Mexican southern border in preparation. And along that line, the head of Mexico's National Immigration Institute, he released a statement saying that Mexico has to guarantee our national territory, and he called for an orderly, safe, and legal migration with respect for human rights and with humanitarian policies. So given the strong response by the Guatemalan and Mexican governments, it looks like this caravan will likely not make it up here to the U.S. as people are already getting sent back to Honduras. However, on a related topic, let's talk about the illegal immigrants who are already here in America, particularly the so-called DREAMers, the ones who fall under the DACA program. So if you don't remember, DACA stands for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and it's an immigration program that was created nine years ago by an executive order from Barack Obama, and it prevented young people who were in the country illegally from being deported, and it also gave them employment authorization as well as access to certain government benefits such as Social Security. So the big question was always this, was that even legal? Can a president create broad new immigration policies by himself without going through Congress? Well, what's interesting is that President Obama himself said that it's not. In October of 2010, here's what he said, I am not king. I can't do these things just by myself. And five months after he said that, he then further said, with respect to the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, that's just not the case. And then two months after that, he said that he was unable to just bypass Congress and change the law myself. That's not how a democracy works. But surprisingly, just 13 months after saying that, President Obama signed the executive order anyway and created the DACA program, which has, for the past nine years now, halted removal proceedings against hundreds of thousands of young people. Afterwards, Congress has not come to any agreement on an immigration bill which addresses this DACA issue. Now, President Trump, upon taking office, he said that the DACA program was unconstitutional and that it actually incentivized people to come to the U.S. illegally. He tried to end the program, but he was blocked by the U.S. courts. Now, in terms of Joe Biden, he has been a long supporter of expanded immigration. And when the Supreme Court ruled against President Trump last year, Joe Biden, on that same day, he vowed to make DACA permanent by sending a bill to Congress on the first day of his administration. 
And along that line, according to a memo that was released by Joe Biden's chief of staff just yesterday, that is still the case. On January 21st, Joe Biden will be sending an immigration bill over to Congress that will include a clear roadmap to citizenship for about 11 million illegal aliens who are living in the United States, which includes the DACA recipients. By the way, I'd love to know what you guys think about this whole DACA program, the constitutionality of it, and the morality of it. Let me know what you think by leaving a comment in the, uh, in the comment section below. Now, by the way, in that same memo that was released by Joe Biden's chief of staff, it outlined several other things that Joe Biden would do upon taking office. This includes rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, reversing President Trump's travel ban on foreigners who were deemed to be a threat to America, an executive order extending the pause on student loan repayments, launching something called a 100-day masking challenge, which will basically require people to wear masks on federal property or as they do interstate travel, as well as an executive order to extend restrictions on the evictions and foreclosures around the country. Now, one thing that has come under very heavy scrutiny is Joe Biden's statements on how he will prioritize minority groups in regards to receiving resources as well as aid. While discussing supporting small businesses from the pandemic, Joe Biden said that the priority for the small business stimulus will be on black, Latino, Asian, and Native American-owned small businesses and woman-owned small businesses finally having equal access to the resources needed to reopen and rebuild. Now, this prioritization that's based on race, sex, ethnicity, and skin color has come under heavy scrutiny. As just an example, Anna Quintana, who is an analyst for the Heritage Foundation, she wrote that, my skin color does not make me more important than my fellow white Americans. Make us all the priority. Now we here at the Epic Times, we reached out to Joe Biden's team for comment, but have yet to hear back. If you'd like to read Joe Biden's full list of priorities for yourself, that link will be in the description box below this video for you to check out. And now let's talk about our favorite subject, big tech censorship. Last week, we already discussed an undercover video which showed Jack Dorsey, who is the CEO of Twitter, discussing how the ban of President Trump was only the beginning of this type of censorship. Now, just today, a new undercover video has just been released by Project Veritas, this time showing one of the senior executives over at Twitter discussing their plan for this type of censorship being on a global scale. Take a look. Yeah, actually, one of the interesting things is a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last um, week is uh, work that we've built on um, in, in other places around the world where we've seen uh, violence unfold as a result of um, either misleading information or um, coded rhetoric. Um, so a lot of our learnings here have come from other markets. So in that sense, um, you know, we do feel like it is, it is, this is our global approach. We need to be very focused on being able to enforce any of these policies or enforcement decisions we make at scale. Now, on a related note, Parler, which calls itself a more free speech friendly alternative to Twitter, is back up online. If you remember, after Amazon kicked them off of their web services last week, Parler's website was basically kicked offline. But apparently they are bouncing back, although with some technical difficulties. When you go over to their website right now, you are greeted with this message from their CEO. Now seems like the right time to remind you all, both lovers and haters, why we started this platform. We believe privacy is paramount and free speech essential, especially on social media. Our aim has always been to provide a nonpartisan public square where individuals can enjoy and exercise their rights to both. We will resolve any challenge before us and plan to welcome all of you back soon. We will not let civil discourse perish. If you'd like to read more about some of the challenges that Parler is facing, or if you'd like to watch that full undercover video from Twitter, those links will be in the description box below this video for you to check out. And now let's talk about election interference. The director of national intelligence sent a letter over to Congress saying that in his assessment, China did interfere in the 2020 presidential election. Furthermore, in that same letter, he alleges that this intelligence about China's election interference was suppressed by the management over at the CIA. In fact, he says that the CIA management team actually pressured the analysts to withdraw their support for this view, the view that China was interfering in our elections. In the letter, he cited a report which said that some analysts were reluctant to describe China's actions as election interference because the analysts disagreed with the policies of President Donald Trump. Now, in regards to how specifically China meddled in our elections, the letter doesn't actually go into it. We reached out to the Office for the Director of National Intelligence for comment, but have yet to hear back. However, we here at the Epic Times, we've actually put together an infographic detailing the multi-pronged approach that the Chinese Communist Party used in our elections. 
Now, it goes without saying that given the new policies here on this platform, I cannot go through this infographic together with you here. But have no fear. I'll throw a link to it in the description box below this video so you can read it for yourself. And I would highly recommend that you do. Because honestly, it is not an overstatement to say that the Chinese Communist Party is the biggest threat to America right now. And yet, it's either overlooked or wholesale ignored by the legacy media outlets. So I would highly recommend that you check out that infographic, educate yourself on it, and maybe even share it with your friends and family. It's, in my opinion, one of the most important topics of our lifetimes. Now, lastly, right here, this is the latest edition of the Epic Times newspaper that you can get delivered directly to your doorstep every single week. In my opinion, this is one of the last sources of honest traditional journalism that you can get in this country. We have a team who work around the clock looking into the happenings of this world, separating the fact from the narrative, and this phenomenal newspaper is where it all goes. And you can get it delivered directly to your doorstep no matter which of the 50 states that you live in. We even deliver it to Puerto Rico. If you'd like to try it out, I'll throw a link in the description box below. And right now you can try it for just a dollar for your first month. If you don't like it, you can cancel. But I think that you will like it and continue. Now, if print is not your thing, by the way, I'll also throw a link in the description box below for a digital subscription. That way you can get the same phenomenal content and read it on your smartphone, your tablet, your home computer, read it wherever. In my opinion, it doesn't really matter how you read the content. The key factor is that you continue to have a conduit to uncensored information especially right now with all of the censorship that's happening on all these social media platforms, a conduit to uncensored information is more critical than ever. And now in closing, if you haven't already, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you want this kind of honest news content delivered directly into your YouTube feed. And until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.